This is Winchester Academy. some technical issues uh, we, we tried out earlier today we were trying out some YouTube clips that we were going to show you uh, that have audio with them uh, I'm not sure we're actually getting the audio now but uh, we'll see how that goes uh, as we go along first of all uh, Art and I are very pleased to be here we want to thank the Academy for inviting us uh, our topic tonight is the physics of musical instruments it's heartening to see so many people here for a lecturer whose title contains the word physics. <laughs> Usually to see a turnout this big for a physics lecture, we need a strictly enforced classroom attendance policy. <laughs> so as you heard, uh, my name is David Tamaris, uh, Professor Emeritus at UW Stevens Point. Uh, Art Stevenson, as you heard, is senior lecturer at uh, UW Stevens Point, also in physics and astronomy. Uh, he's also a uh, renowned bluegrass musician, and uh, he has a loyal following here in Wisconsin and throughout the country. And the best harmonica player in the state. And the best harmonica <laughs> player in the state. <laughs> uh, earlier, I was going to try, I mean, before, as you were getting seated, I was hoping to have some uh, Bach music playing in the background with some images of church organs. Uh, that didn't work out so well, but here is an image of some church organs, <laughs> pipe organs. Uh, some of the larger ones of this sort uh, can be easily two to three times the height of, a, of an adult human being. Uh, we didn't bring any of those big ones with us today, <laughs> but we did bring one of its small cousins uh, this thing. If you cover up the holes of the instrument, the six holes of the instrument, uh, it becomes very much like uh, one of those church organs. It has an open mouth at the, in the upper left. Uh, at the other end, it's open, although some church organs are closed at the other end, but most of them are open. But the principles by which they operate are pretty much the same. By the way, this instrument that you're looking at here on the screen uh, it goes by a few different names. It's called a penny whistle, sometimes called a tin whistle. In traditional Irish music circles, it tends to be just called a whistle. There apparently is a tremendous recent boom in the popularity of this instrument. You can hardly open a newspaper these days without reading about some whistleblower or another. <laughs> <laughs> this evening I'll be speaking to you about the physics of wind instruments, then I'll turn things over to Art Stevenson who will talk to you about the physics of stringed instruments. The thing that wind instruments and stringed instruments have in common is that their music making ability derives from the same physics principle, which I will talk about here on this slide. First of all, uh, sound, at least as the term is used in physics, <coughs> begins as a disturbance in a gas, a liquid, or a solid. That disturbance could be the clap of a hand, which produces outgoing ripples of air pressure, which eventually reach your ears. It could be a pebble thrown onto the surface of a pond, which creates outgoing ripples on the, in the water. The disturbance then propagates outward as a wave. This can be a wave, a one-dimensional wave, that is a wave on a string. It can be a two-dimensional wave, a wave propagating on the surface of liquid. Or it could be a three-dimensional wave propagating outward in three dimensions through the air, from the speakers to your ears, for example. Now, in an unbounded medium, there's no restriction 
on the frequency or the wavelength for propagating waves. They can have any frequency, any wavelength. But, and here's where the kicker comes in for musical instruments, stringed instruments, wind instruments, other types. When you apply what physicists call boundary conditions, then a weird thing happens to waves. No longer can you have just any old frequency, any old wavelength. All of a sudden, the waves are restricted to certain patterns, what we call modes. Uh, and furthermore, uh, since each so-called mode or pattern has its own frequency, its own pitch, if you will, the statement that boundary conditions impose a restricted set of wave patterns, wave modes, that each have their own frequency, that's equivalent to saying that the imposition of boundary conditions means that you only get a certain restricted set of frequencies. And musicians have names for this restricted set of frequencies. They call them harmonics, they call them overtones, they call them partials. But the way a musical instrument is able to make music is because each musical instrument has its own boundary conditions, which restricts the waves to a certain set of modes and frequencies. So what exactly is a boundary condition? Uh, probably the easiest way to visualize what a boundary condition is, is to think of a guitar string. Uh, the guitar string can vibrate at will, but at one end of the string it's fixed in position, it's tied down. At the other end of the string it's fixed in position, and it's tied down. At those two ends, it may not vibrate. Those are the boundary conditions. And once you impose those, all of a sudden the guitar string is only able to vibrate in certain patterns and is only able to produce a certain set of frequencies or harmonics or overtones. Uh, I'll be talking to you mostly about wind instruments and the boundary conditions in that case is, works a little differently, but we'll get to that in a moment. <coughs> In a musical instrument, the frequencies and the intensities of these modes of vibration combine to give the instrument a unique tonal quality. They help make a clarinet sound like a clarinet. They help make a violin sound like a violin. So uh, in physics, we're interested in questions such as, um, what's the instrument actually doing? What's happening inside the instrument? to produce its sounds, to produce its harmonics, to produce its overtones. Now, since I'm going to focus on wind instruments, I will start with the simplest kind of wind instrument you might imagine. And that is a simple cylindrical hollow tube. This is what we do in physics. If we want to understand something that might be complicated, we always boil it down to something really, really, really simple at first. And we try to understand the behavior of that very simple system. Once we think we understand that, we start adding in complications and more complications until we have a system that mimics what happens in the real world. But in the spirit of physics, we'll start with a very simple wind system. And that's just a plain old open tube, something like this. This is a hollow tube. It's open at this end. It's open at the other end. And uh, this will be starring in a demonstration pretty soon. <laughs> not, not quite yet. But within the family of cylindrical uh, tubes, we break it down into two subcategories, the open tube and the closed tube. Now, the open tube, as you might imagine, is open at both ends. The closed tube, however, notice it's only closed at one end and it's open at the other. When I use the term closed tube, I mean it's closed at one end only but it's open at the other. Why don't we deal with tubes that are closed at both ends? <laughs> well, maybe you've had the experience of taking a Coke bottle, an empty Coke bottle, glass Coke bottle, and you blow into the Coke bottle and you get this booming, resonant sound. How many have done that? Okay, pretty much everybody. Those who remember glass Coke bottles. Uh, uh, imagine trying that, uh, you've got your empty Coke bottle, but then you put the cap back on, and you try blowing into it. <laughs> Not much is going to happen. If you have a tube that's capped at one end and capped at the other, closed at both ends, 
you really don't get music out of them. So uh, in terms of studying musical instruments, these are only the two types of tubes we, we bought with the open tubes and the tubes closed at one end. Now, here's where it gets kind of physics-y. Uh, I'm going to talk about open tubes, first of all, and talk about the first mode of vibration you can get for the air inside such a tube. And you see this uh, weird diagram. You're seeing in the, the black bars, the upper and lower horizontal black bars, these represent the uh, walls of the tube. You're looking at the tube in cross-section. And there is uh, air within the tube. The tube is open at both ends. Down below, this, uh, I don't know why I kept this in. I, capital L uh, with arrows represents, stands for the length of the tube. Don't worry about that. But uh, focus, please, on the red pattern. You see a red arc, uh, an upper one, a lower one. And to a physicist, this has a particular meaning. It's hinting at what's going on inside of a tube like this when it's resonating in the first harmonic. There are boundary conditions here. And here are the boundary conditions. This tube is open at both ends. It's exposed to the outside air at both ends. And the outside air is at room air pressure. What is it, 14.7 pounds per square inch? <laughs> Atmospheric pressure. That's what happens when you're retired for three years. You start <laughs> spacing out. One atmosphere, One atmosphere pressure. Okay. So uh, at the left end of the tube over here, uh, the air is at one atmosphere pressure. And at the other end of the tube, it's open to the air, which is at one atmosphere pressure. At the ends of the tube, the pressure is one atmosphere. At the ends of the tube, the pressure is one atmosphere. That never changes, no matter what's going on inside the tube. No matter what the air is doing inside the tube, at the left end and at the right end, the pressure is one atmosphere. Those are the boundary conditions for this kind of a tube. On a string, the string is tied down at both ends. The string is fixed in position at both ends. For a tube, it's the air pressure that's fixed in, that's fixed in value at both ends. Now, inside the tube, when you have various harmonics going, and we're going to talk first about the first harmonic. Inside the tube, the pressure can be doing lots of different things. It can be going up, it can be going down. Uh, but at the ends, the pressure is one atmosphere, period. Those are the boundary conditions. That's the restriction. Now, uh, what you're seeing here in, in, in that red pattern is indicating that at the left end, you have uh, what we call a pressure node. The pressure can't change. The pressure is one atmosphere, remember? That's a pressure node. And there's a pressure node over here as well. But halfway in between, you see uh, there's a big space between the upper red arc, the lower red arc. That's a location of the, what we call a pressure antinode. And what's happening there is that the pressure is actually uh, varying between high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. Unlike at the ends where the pressure is staying constant, one atmosphere, in the middle the pressure is alternately high, low, high, low, high, low. Why is that? Well here's what happens in this kind of an instrument. And those of you who play flutes, play whistles, uh, pay attention because this is what your flute, this is what your instrument is doing. When it's uh, playing in the first harmonic, air comes in from both ends. Air comes in from both ends. That squeezes the air in the middle, compresses the air in the middle. And compressed air is high pressure air. What happens next is that air starts coming out from both ends of the tube. And as air comes out from both ends of the tube, it leaves kind of a rarefaction, a partial vacuum in the middle. That's low pressure. Then air comes rushing back from both ends, compresses the air in the middle. So you get your high pressure in the middle. Then air comes, I wouldn't say gushing out, but some air comes out, leaving a partial vacuum in the middle. So in the middle of this tube, you get this alternation between high pressure air, low pressure air, high pressure air, low pressure air. The number of complete cycles that it goes through per second 
That's the frequency, that's the pitch that you hear. In a flute that's playing a concert A, 440 hertz, this cycle is repeating itself 440 times every second. Now, there are other harmonics besides just the first one. We'll get to those. But the first harmonic is the slowest one. It takes the longest time to go through one cycle. It's associated with the lowest pitch. If I take my whistle and I blow gently, what you're hearing mainly is the first harmonic. That's the lowest pitch I can, I can make with this. There are other harmonics mixed in, but the, low, the one you heard mainly was the first harmonic. Now, this wouldn't be a physics lecture if I didn't throw an equation in. So, uh, I'm not going to turn you into uh, professional calculators of frequency, but I did want to show this to you for a particular reason. Uh, let's suppose you have uh, an instrument. You learn how to play the first harmonic. And for some reason or another, you'd like to change that pitch, you'd like to have it play a different pitch for the first harmonic. What would you have to do to make it an instrument of this nature play, uh, play a different frequency, different pitch uh, for the first harmonic? According to this formula, the way the, fir the first harmonic frequency is calculable, you take the speed of sound in air, the speed of sound in this room, and you divide it by twice the length of the tube. Well, if you'd like to play a different note for the first harmonic, if you'd like to play this as your first harmonic, what can you do? Well, you have two choices. You can change the speed of sound. That's not easy to do. And we don't really try. Or you could change the tube length. And that's what we do. That's why things like whistles come in a whole family of lengths. So if I want to play a tune that's got kind of a low pitch, I'll use uh, a longer whistle. If I want to play a tune at a higher pitch, I'll use a shorter whistle. Now you may think, well, that's a pretty dumb idea because if you want to play Mary Had a Little Lamb, for example, every time I play a different note, do I have to put down the whistle, pick up a different length whistle, and play the next note, that would be pretty impractical. I demonstrate, but you get bored real quick. So we've figured out a way to overcome that problem, and that is by putting these side holes. You can see each of these whistles has six holes in it. And the reason for the holes is that they allow you to change the length of the tube, believe it or not. Really, what's of concern to us is the length of the vibrating air column not the tube itself, about the length of the vibrating air column. Now, if I let, up, let my finger off one of these holes, the air column that's vibrating is between that open slot and the first open hole. And if I take my finger off here, the length of the air column is from here to the first open hole. So I literally change the length of the instrument by taking my fingers off these holes. So I can get That's all first harmonic. Want to hear some second harmonic? Yeah. All the way up to fourth harmonic there. Okay, so uh, I've talked about the first harmonic. That formula that I gave you was just the formula for the first harmonic frequency. But the thing about instruments, wind instruments, stringed instruments, is you can play not just the first harmonic, but other harmonics. Now, I have my demonstration here, remember? This is a tube, it's open at both ends, could hardly be a simpler instrument. It's just a hollow plastic tube, open at the left, open at the right. Now, how many of you have played with this instrument before? Okay, you might think that as I twirl this around, and that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to twirl it around, that you might hear a pitch that rises gradually, something like this. By the way, what 
am I doing here? I'm changing the length of the tube. Right. Here, I, I'm not going to change the length of the tube. I'm just going to twirl the tube. Now, you might think you might get a, the, the faster I spin it, you'll get a continuous rise in, sound, in frequency like a siren. That's not what happens. Listen to what happens. Can you hear that you only got certain notes? Certain specific notes. What you were hearing was second, very hard to get the first harmonic out of this. Second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, fifth harmonic. Those are the only notes this can play. Uh, a simple instrument, simple tube. It's got a boundary condition at this end, boundary condition at that end. Only certain modes and certain frequencies can happen. Now the same thing happens with a bugle. Any buglers in here? Well, certainly you've heard buglers play uh, reveille, taps, to the colors, assembly, or any of a couple of other dozen military bugle calls. Have you ever wondered why the bugle, whatever it's doing, it's playing the same small handful of notes just in different order, different durations? That's because the bugle can't play anything else. The bugle can only play that certain specific set of notes, first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic. If you ask it to play a note in between, the bugler can't do it. The instrument won't do it. Now, to me, this was a big revelation. I was teaching physics for a while before this principle dawned on me. I had grown up playing guitar. With a guitar, you can play pretty much any note. Don't like the note you're playing? Increase the tension on the string, bend the string. You can get pretty much any note you want. It was a revelation that there are instruments like a bugle that can't play any note they want to play. They only can play certain notes. And that's because of this harmonic uh, series. Okay, this fellow, I don't know if we're going to get this to work. Uh, it's a, a YouTube clip. Uh, the fellow in France, he builds these uh, flutes that have no holes except for the one up near where the mouth goes. So it's uh, actually it's kind of like a church organ that you blow with your mouth. It has no side holes. And what he is able to do, and it amazes me that he can do this, is he can play 11 different harmonics on this thing. And uh, okay, let's see if it works. It's working. Okay. He's speaking in French. There are English subtitles, but listen for the tones he gets from his flute, which has no holes, just that one hole near the mouthpiece. He's he's going to be exciting eleven different harmonics in succession. There it is. Now, over, uh, thank you, Mark. Well, uh, here he's playing the C below middle C. Here he's playing middle C. This is uh, G above middle C. This is the next C right over there. And if you were to ask him, uh, please play the note halfway between this one and that one. Halfway between middle C and E above middle C. Or, sorry, G above middle C. And the response you're likely to get from him is the French equivalent of go jump in a lake. <laughs> can't be done. It can't be done. These are the only notes that instrument can play. 
But he can get 11, I'm amazed, he gets 11 harmonics. I can get four on this instrument. I'm covering up all the holes, I'll keep all the holes covered up. Here's the first harmonic. Second. Third. Fourth. I can get four. This guy gets 11. Okay, in the time remaining, I, I want to show you what's going on with a couple of other harmonics, like the second harmonic. Again, boundary conditions. At the left end of the tube, the pressure must be one atmosphere. At the right end of the tube, the pressure must be one atmosphere. But here, we have two places. Over here and over there, where that pattern gets wide. There we have a couple of pressure antinodes. Those are places where the air is getting compressed and rarefied, compressed, rarefied, compressed, rarefied. And I'll try to show 880 actually. Okay, I've got this, uh, see if I can get this to work. Uh, I hope this works for you. This is a little animation that I put together in Excel. Did you know you can animate in Excel? Uh, this represents uh, the air molecules inside of a tube, very much of an idealization. The air molecules don't really all line up in vertical lines like this. But what I want to illustrate is what's happening with the air inside of a tube when it's executing the second harmonic. Air is going to be moving in and out of the ends that's okay. That's, you, you need that to happen. But what you're looking for is this. Over here, about one-third the way from the left end and one-third the way in from the right end, look for these compressions and rarefactions. Uh, so let's see, do, do I have uh, yeah, it's second line. Here we go. See the compression here on the, on, the, on the left? And a half cycle later, you see the compression on the right? Okay, when a wind instrument is playing in, in the second harmonic, that's what's happening. That's what the air is doing. Would you like to see a third harmonic? With a third harmonic, there are going to be three places where you get compressions and rarefactions. So I'll pause for each for each compression. Uh, here we go. Oh, by the way, this is going to go a little faster because the higher you go in harmonic, the higher the frequency, the shorter amount of time to go through one cycle. So this should go... Yeah? Um, how many harmonics can you get at a time? How many harmonics can you get at a time? Ah, Mr. Stevenson, Mr. Stevenson is going to show you mm -hmm. that you can get lots of harmonics uh, in fact, uh, the device Mr. Stevenson is going to demonstrate for you, uh, it's going to run out of space before it's... There are more harmonics than his device can show. Okay. So lots of harmonics. Uh, you, 10, 20, typically, on an instrument, maybe more. And what's cool is that if you know how to work the instrument, you can suppress certain harmonics. You can cancel them out just by what you're doing with your fingers on the instrument. That's a trick that, I mean, if you play some chimes on the guitar, I'll, I'll show you that. Anyway, here's third harmonic. Watch for the three places where you get compressions. Oh, let me pause it right there. You see compression here, compression there, but a half cycle later, there'll be a third compression, and it's right in the middle of the tube. Here it comes. There it is. Is that working for you? Okay. Okay, well, I think um, that's all 
Oops. Uh, how does this? No, that, wait a minute. All right, thanks, David. Uh, we, uh, we're, I'd like to, to bring up the, the lute and guitar uh, a little bit here, and, and uh, they're actually rather complicated systems that go into uh, making a uh, any musical instrument, and uh, and the guitar, of course, is, is one that, that is complicated. But uh, we'll concentrate just on on the strings, I think. You need to turn your mic on. Oh. One two one two. One two one two. Two one two. One, two, one, two. There I am. Hey! All right. Good, good, good. Display settings. We've been running around with uh, these uh, little uh, source searching, source detect, and here we go. All right. So uh, I was talking about the loot. The loot was popular uh, hundreds of years ago in, in box time. And I'm not a loot player, but the loot had a number of strings on it, sometimes four, sometimes six, sometimes more than that. And uh, over the ensuing centuries since Bach's time, it's evolved into the Spanish style guitar, among other things, and the mandolin and other, I suppose the ukulele. Uh, and so it is a stringed instrument, and I play the guitar, so I've decided to talk about the strings uh, part of the guitar, uh, which make it uh, give it a, a, uh, a particular tone that we've come to expect to hear from a guitar. So, uh, back up here. Anyway, so for uh, a musical instrument to work, it's probably not going to produce a, a single pitch like a tuning fork. Um, a tuning fork produces basically a single frequency. It's just one frequency. It's pretty much the harmonic, the first harmonic that, uh, that this, this empty, or this, this uh, box that's open on one side so has as a characteristic. Note? What's the note? The note? Um, this note, ah, it's not stamped with the note of all things. So uh, anyway, it is, it, is a, a pure, it is a pure tone. It just basically has one frequency that you can hear. And, and yet the guitar has many. Uh, so that when I pluck a string on the guitar, um, what I get is I disturb the string, and among other things, a vibration occurs. Now, if you look closely at a string of a guitar, you can see that it vibrates with a uh, sort of a amplitude, so to speak, in the middle, and it'll vibrate back and forth. And if you're if you're a guitar player, you're used to seeing that. You can kind of see it moving around like this. Uh, I've got a very large one set up here that, that's easier to see, and so if I just disturb it one time, you can see that it's it's vibrating uh, with. If I pluck it in the middle, maybe I can get it to just vibrate uh, with a large anti-node uh, disturbance in the middle. And this is what we call the, the first harmonic of the string. It's constrained to vibrate in this way and other ways because it's got uh, an end fastened at uh, perhaps the top knot of the guitar, which is this. Um, so it's fastened there. I've got to put it on the pulley so that it works properly. Um, and of course, it's constrained uh, by the bridge too. So it's free to vibrate in between those two uh, connection points. Um, what I'd like to try to demonstrate to you is that it produces uh, a rather complicated tone, a complex tone made of several different harmonics that are going pretty much at the same time. Um, so it's hard to see a guitar string do that. And it, it, it's probably easier to demonstrate that it does that by just, just fingering in a certain way. Um, but all the systems that uh, come together, so to speak, to, to uh, produce this tone is that uh, the guitar basically, when I, when I pluck the string, the string vibrates 
for some amount of time. Uh, the, the work I do to disturb the string uh, is carried as a wave that bounces back and forth uh, between the bridge and, and the uh, nut. And there's a contact point here at the bridge, among other contact points. There's a contact point here at the bridge, and the bridge actually transfers the sound waves down through into the wood of the guitar top. And the guitar top is, is basically a, a solid membrane, but it is free to vibrate. So when you, when you tap on it, um, it, you can hear a tone as well, which is made up of several frequencies. So that's a different system. Um, a system like this should be free to vibrate at multiple modes so that it resonates at different frequencies. You're probably not hearing that very well, but that's it's, uh, resonating along with the tuning fork there kind of weakly. Um, so the top has to, has to vibrate rather freely too, kind of like a drum head. And then the inside of the guitar is an opening, it's just an airspace with the hole. Um, as we talked about, if you put a cap on a Coke bottle, you're not going to get any sound out of it, and so the physics are locked inside. So you have to have a way for the sound to get out. And the shape of the guitar uh, allows it to, again, resonate at certain frequencies, the tone uh, consisting of several different pitches combined to make what we, what we uh, detect as a guitar sound and we associate it as a guitar sound. Uh, so let's take a look at what's happening on the guitar string. Uh, it's very difficult to see that on a uh, the guitar that I have in front of the room here. I've got a video though that's very curious. Um, if I can show you this just briefly, a minute ago we looked at that big disturbance in the center of the string from the first harmonic, which makes the, the center of the string kind of go like this. Um, if the guitar is to produce tone, the string is going to have to vibrate with, with other modes of vibration. It's going to have different wavelengths on it besides that big, huge disturbance in the middle. And so I found some YouTube videos in which uh, a fast camera with a, with a very high-speed shutter was used to, uh, to photograph the waveforms on guitar strings. And so you can kind of see, I'm not even going to press the button just yet, but you can kind of see here these little waveforms on the string, and, and then on the ones over here too, these little waveforms that are very short wavelength uh, harmonics that are happening. And so, so those are some of the higher harmonics that are occurring in the string, and I don't know why that happened. Um, okay, good old Wi-Fi, full of mysteries. I understand a GoPro camera, if you get the right model, has a fast enough shutter that you can do this with a GoPro, but I didn't, I didn't take these. But you can see all the little tiny wavelengths on there that are, that are higher harmonics that are happening on the guitar. Uh, this one shows the same thing, except the, uh, the camera was inside the guitar looking out. <laughs> Not much audio to this one, but you can see the waves. So I've set up uh, a couple of models to try to demonstrate this too, that we can get more than one waveform on a string. And uh, guitar strings are made of steel. They're wound very tightly. Um, let's see if I can find the slide that will tell you what's going on with that. Are you saying every time you play the guitar, those strings are doing that? From yes, yes they are. Yes they are, you betcha. Um, there's all kinds of stuff going on in there. Now, what, what, what we think is happening, I, you know, if you don't know any, any different, um, if, if, you know, if it's not pointed out to you by somebody, then you, let's see, where's the button on this thing here? Here we go. Oh yeah, all right, beautiful. Okay, so this is what I was showing you before. The big, the big disturbance in the center of the guitar string that we all see when we pluck a guitar or we play a fiddle, you can see it vibrating freely, and it's bound on either end by the bridge and the top nut. So that's the one we're used to talking about there. So that's, that's what's called the fundamental frequency, the first harmonic. So it happens, it happens to be the lowest frequency we can sound on a guitar string. But there are also other harmonics going on too. So if you divide the, the string length in two, um, if, you, if you just hold your finger here, and you don't even have to put it down on the fret, um, you can, you can uh, just apply a small amount of pressure 
So my guitar string is divided in two if I press my finger right here. Um, if, I, if I pluck it open, I get pretty much, whoops. What did I ask? What you ask going on here? Whoops. So, uh, I get pretty much the fundamental as the loudest um, frequency, but if I, if I damp it right here, I'm dividing the string length in two. And so that's, that's the second harmonic right there. So that's, that's this one where disturbance occurs on either end of the center of the string. Uh, and you can, get, you can get numbers of harmonics up and down the neck by dividing it into three, I think. Okay, so there's one. That, that might be the fourth, actually. So they're all over the place. And when I, when I strike the string somewhere in between here, I get a number of those sounding at the same time. Um, if I... If I want to favor the lower frequencies, like, you know, the, the first and the second, I can pluck it somewhere up here. And so I get those lower frequencies favored, because I'm exciting it pretty much where the anti-note is for those, those particular frequencies. But if I want to excite the high ones, then I plug it. Where the anti-note for a very, very short, uh, short wavelength would be with a much, much higher frequency. So these are all going along at the same time on the guitar string, uh, multiple frequencies, which, which make this uh, instrument sound the way it does. Uh, more math here, unfortunately, but it's, it's, based, it's based mainly on simple fractions. Um, it turns out that the disturbance that's passing back and forth between the bridge and the top uh, nut is, on the first harmonic, actually a very large wavelength. It's, it's only half of a, a wave disturbance. Um, and so the wavelength is actually twice the length of this string, which is about 75 centimeters. So, so the wavelength for the first harmonic on this guitar is probably about one and a half meters. But then when you go to the, uh, the second harmonic, um, it fits exactly on the string. And so one wavelength is equal to the length of the string. In that point. And so hence you can, you can come up with a little equation uh, based on the fractional lengths that, uh, that you get when you get to the third harmonic and the fourth and so on and so on. Um, what's happening is, uh, let's see. Are you talking octaves? Um, in between the first and the second, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so again, uh, what's happening at the very top of the screen here is the frequency that you hear, the pitch, is based on the harmonic number. It's proportional to the harmonic number, you know, where n is equal to one for the first and two for the second and three for the third and so on. But it's inversely proportional to the string length. And so, you know, if I go with a shorter string length, uh, like for instance, if I pluck it up here, uh, I get a, a higher frequency, but a shorter waveform on the string, you know, which is how I play the guitar. Um, that's how you change the pitch if you're, if you're performing, you just change the string length. And so, so you know, the wave, the waveform, uh, the length of that is, is inversely proportional to what you're hearing. So short wavelengths have high frequencies. Um, so something else is going on in the square root side that's very interesting. Uh, string tension. Now this is, this is basically how you tune a guitar. Uh, and I'll show you these models in a minute. They're really fun to look at, but I'm kind of in front of this right now. So uh, at any rate, you've noticed that uh, if you're a fiddle player, a violin player, or uh, any kind of string player, harp player, piano player, you probably looked inside the piano and saw the strings in there, that they come in different, uh, different diameters. And that the different diameters uh, seem to have different pitches. So if I want a low frequency, I'll, I'll have a, a big, thick diameter string. If I want a high frequency, uh, for fundamental, I, I, I have a, basically a wire, a, a skinny little wire. Um, and in fact, the E string, and the B string are just steel wires, but they have different diameters. Now what we're doing is we're changing the density of the string. I, I call it the string density here, but it's basically how much mass there is per, per the length of the string. And so the, uh, the lower strings have a lot of mass, so they're, they're very inertial. They tend to, uh, they tend to resist the, you know, the disturbances that are, that are passing through them, and so they have a different pitch. So that's basically how we tune the guitar. Uh, we use machine heads. And so we change the tension on the strings, and, and uh, the string density, that is, can be used to uh, uh, create a wide range of frequencies um, over 
you know, six strings um, without really changing much of the string tension. Uh, string tension is very curious too. Uh, you should you should uh, know, which was a, a surprise to me, uh, how much tension there is in say six strings on a guitar. So I use medium strings, and so this is an advertiser who actually tells you how you know what the diameter of the string is in inches, and it's, it's just a few hundredths of an inch or thousands. And then to the right of that, there's a number that, like for instance, E1, it says 0 .010, uh, 0.010 inches slash 16. So that means that string has 16 pounds of tension in it when it's tuned up. Uh, and then uh, over on the right, it tells you the total tension for six strings. So extra light strings, 131 pounds on this guitar. You know, if I was to use extra lights. I use mediums, and so it's, it's getting up there close to 200 pounds. Um, so this, this creates a problem because if you want the guitar to sound good, it's got to be able to vibrate freely. So if I have a big, thick top, it's going to sound like me just hitting on, you know, the table. You know, it's not going to vibrate freely at all. And so uh, that's part of the reason that, that you have different mass per unit length uh, values or string densities. So uh, if I had the same string diameter here, this, this little E string, if I was to use that as a low E string, I'd have to loosen it way, way up, and there'd be a big difference in tension across uh, the six string attachments here. And so that, that would create a torque on the top, which would be very difficult to uh, to work with uh, bracing wise. If you were going to the guitar, twelve string have twice as much. Yeah, twelve strings have more, and so they have to. The neck has to be braced. There's usually a truss rod in the neck to, yeah. for strength, uh, a different kind of truss rod than this one, perhaps. Um, let's see if I can find you. Uh, there we go. Okay, I had my D18 taken apart because uh, this this is not the guitar that I'm showing you. I have a D18 at home that I play on stage. This is my campfire guitar. It's not, not as expensive, and so I can take it anywhere and not worry about it too much. But anyway, uh, I spent a lot of money getting my D18 fixed. I've had it for 35 years, and the top the top was starting to belly up. It was starting to, to rise because of torque uh, from basically the strings pulling on it and, and making it kind of want to rotate up. Bracing had come loose, and the the guy was he was trying to explain to me, I got to take the top off your guitar. He said, it's done with violins all the time. You know, that's the only way you can work on the inside of a, of a violin because the, the holes are so small. Usually the work on a guitar is done through the top, of, through the hole itself, the sound hole. And you can get in there with a mirror and a lamp, a little teen lamp and some tools and things. But uh, my braces were coming loose and there were gaps and there were places where the glue was stretching out and so on and so forth. So uh, he took the top off and fixed it. And this, this is the problem that uh, comes up because of, of the tension that the guitar experiences. And it's a 1964 guitar, so it's been experiencing those for all those years and all the abuse that I gave it to. Um, but uh, anyway, so, so string tension is very important too, um, mainly in the, the mechanics of the guitar and how to tune it. Uh, that's why we have string, uh, we, have, uh, we have machine heads here, which adjust the tension. So if I want to reduce the tension on the string, um, the frequency goes down. So that's that's used mainly to tune the stringed instrument. But of course, if you have slinky strings, if you're a rock player and you're using light strings, you can actually you know you can actually bend the string. And I, I can barely do it because these are these are not slinky strings. But it, you can change the pitch by actually bending the strings too. So you know it's a it's a guitar playing trick that you can use too. Uh, but usually it's just used for um, uh, for tuning up. So anyway, I think it's time to look at some of these big demonstrations so you can see these waves in action. Uh, David, can we try the the big spring? Okay, hold on tight to your end. Because if one of us lets go, the other one's going to be in trouble. <laughs> okay, the reason, the reason we're using this is because it's very heavy. Uh, there's a lot of mass per unit length. There's, there's a high string density of this. And so the pulses, when they go through it, actually you, you can actually watch them go. So I'll disturb it like this, and you can see the pulse going back and forth. 
Now on a guitar string, we wouldn't be able to see this because the amplitude is, is too small, and the, you wouldn't believe how fast the strings, uh, the, the speed of the guitar string uh, wave is. It's something like 150 meters per second. And so those, those waves are going too fast for the eye to see, but not in this big slinky. Um, it's more like two or three meters per second of a wave speed, and so you can see the disturbance going back and forth. So this is what's happening in a guitar string. When I pluck it, there's a disturbance going back and forth, and it's, it's hitting the, the nut and the bridge and reflecting off of that constrained point, that contact point, like this. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. Now, because of the tension and the length of the string, if I start messing around with it and trying to get it to vibrate, and boy, I got lucky that time, it, uh, a harmonic came right up, and it happens to be the second harmonic. Uh, isn't that nice? So, so two people, two people could jump rope if they were daring <laughs> enough, I guess. Uh, and uh, and so, so uh, what's happening is I'm adding energy. I'm doing work on the spring by disturbing it at just the right frequency that it, it matches this one natural harmonic. Of, of the guitar string. And so, let's see if I can go a little slower, maybe I can find the first harmonic. So here we go. That's the first harmonic right there. That's only half the frequency. That's one octave below, it turns out. Uh, one octave below the second harmonic, okay? And if I try to do other frequencies, it won't work unless I match it exactly. And uh, if, I, if I work really hard, I might be able to get the third harmonic. Let's see. <laughs> Woo! Here it is! How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, David. Sorry about that. So, yeah, you can actually see them because because this stuff is, the spring is so massive that you know, the, the wave passes very slowly through it and it disturbs it. But, um, I have another uh, wave control device here. So this one's a, it's basically a 3 8 horsepower drill uh, <laughs> that's been turned on its side and fastened. And uh, it's got a fishing swivel here uh, because the, the disturbance is actually a rotating uh, offset. And you know, I, there's other ways of doing this, but this way works fine. And so I have to tie the swivel off. Uh, if you're a fisherman or a woman, you know what I'm talking about. With spinner baits, you can't just uh, reel them in without uh, without having some kind of swivel attachment. Otherwise, your line will wind up, and so that's what's going on here. So anyway, I've got about uh, four meters of length. This, this nice string. And if you can't see from the back, please do stand up. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't get this thing up higher. Um, so I'll increase the disturbance until I get an anti-node in the middle, a big disturbance in the middle. And so here we are at the first harmonic, and you can see it very plainly. I have to kind of match the frequency just right to get it to, to be exactly at that harmonic. Um, so four meters away on the other side, this, this, this would be, for instance, the top nut, and that's where I'm plucking down there closer to the bridge. And I've got it weighted. I've got some tension on it. And so, Let's say I don't like this particular frequency. It's too low. I want to turn it up to pitch. You know, it's not up to, to A440 or, or concert pitch. And so I'm going to have to change uh, the tension. I'm going to have to turn up the tension by adding a weight. I've just basically doubled the tension on this string. And the antinote has disappeared. Uh, the harmonic has disappeared. So let's see if we can find it. I have to turn the frequency up because as I tighten the string, it tends to vibrate at a higher frequency for its, its fundamental. So there we go. It turns out it's a square root function too, so it, it, it tricks the, the introductory students, the introductory physics students, because I say, I say, what happens when we you know, double the string tension? And they go, oh, the frequency's gonna double, but it doesn't. It actually just goes up by the square root of the factor that you change it. So, so it's really hard. It's really hard. You, you take physics for the first time and you just don't see that, you know. But anyway, some some of them catch on right away, and I love seeing that. And then some of them I just have to tell them. Uh, let's see how many frequencies we can get out of this. Uh, there's the second one. That's the second harmonic right there. I, have to, 
actually have to clamp this thing down because it tends to vibrate rather violently at, at some point. So there's the third harmonic. So, Number of kids. so one whole disturbance goes from here to here all the way to this one. So that's one wavelength from that spot to this spot right here. So it's two-thirds of a wave fit on this string. Uh, let's see how high we can go here. All right, fourth harmonic, yay. Get it up higher. Oh, my machine is behaving itself really well. Look at that, five harmonics. Whoa! I better back off. <laughs> Actually, I have to cheat. If I want to show uh, like 20 harmonics, you want to see 20 harmonics? Right? Here's how I cheat. I just change the tension. That's got to be at least 20 harmonics. How about that? <laughs> so, um, so I guess my point is all of these are happening, well, maybe not all of them, but, but a great number of them are happening on the guitar uh, as you play it. And of course you're combining strings too. Uh, and so, so there's, there's the tone of, of two strings, or, or even six if you strum all the way across that are combined, hopefully it's in tune. Um, I wish I could show you a picture of what's going on on the guitar, and uh, if you bear with me for just a second, I might be able to do that. Um, I've got an app on my on my uh, cell phone. Don't swallow that big. Don't swallow that big. No. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can call up the app and project it to the computer here. Um, Oh, thanks for turning that off. Yeah, thank you. For <laughs> End up in outer space, I suppose. Um, let's, see. let's see, binoculars, okay. Uh, if this doesn't work, I'll play you a song. How about that? <laughs> All right, yeah. Then we'll have to play a song if I can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so anyhow, um, this this is what we do. We do physics, but we're very curious about the way things work, and it's it's fascinating to study science, but it's also fascinating to study the very things that that we love, which you know, musical instruments. Everybody loves a musical instrument. Everybody loves music, and so uh, before we. Play a number or two. Are there any questions about guitar strings or guitars? Yes. Okay. You, you talked about the, the hole and the fact that that uh, that you have to have to let the sound out. Yep. The hole is smaller. Is the mic. Was there a difference in the sound yes, the between the, the round hole and the F hole? Uh, let's see. Tony Rice would think so, and so would uh, Clarence White, the ex, you know, the guy that he, he's been dead for a long time, but he actually cut his sound hole on his D28 Martin wider open because he thought that he'd get better tone out of it. He was, I think he was right. Tony Rice bought his guitar after, after Clarence died and still plays it today and it's got this big board out sound hole. And I think the Santa Cruz Guitar Company actually makes that model with, or, or has tried to recreate that model with the enlarged sound hole. And it's a total, it's a total difference that they're seeking to get. One last question that uh, when, a, when a train goes by and the whistle sounds, the pitch changes. Is it because of the speed of the wave that's going on? Um, the speed of the wave is constant in the air. And so, so uh, that doesn't change at all. But, but when the train is coming towards you, um, the waves that it emits are compressed together. So that, you know, the, the, the beats, or I should say, the, the disturbances are reaching you in, in, a, in a greater rate per second or a greater frequency. 
And so they're, they're kind of all squeezed together as the train approaches you, so you hear a higher pitch. Then when it goes past you, they're emitted, as you see it, at a lower frequency. And so you receive those waves at a lower frequency, so it drops as it goes by. So yeah, it's called the Doppler effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's used in astronomy too, isn't it? Could you repeat those two questions for you there was a question about why a train uh, makes a pitch change as it goes past you, and it's because of something called the Doppler effect, right? All right. I have oh, a yes. I don't know if it's working. Mark's not working. No. It's not working. <coughs> that, the one right next to the bag, I think I've got turned on. No. I'll just talk about. So when you talk about A440, which is what we in the Western, I guess. We tune to A440, so the 440 means frequency? It is 440 hertz. Um, on the guitar, this is like four octaves below that pitch, so that's 110, I think. Okay. That's 110. Uh, but we tune, we tune to A440 like for pianos, but there's a band in the valley that believes 432 is better. <laughs> 432 is better? And they tune everything to 432. They went one way and flattened scrubs went the other. Did they go up? Flat and Scruggs went a half pitch or a half, a half step sharp. So, so if Lester Flat was playing like an open A chord, it would actually be B flat. And I think that was for singing, or you know, it was either for singing or because they thought the instrument sounded better tuned sharp like that. But boy, that brings up the tension on those things. It does. I mean, even a half step. Yeah. So. And you don't know anything else about why four thirty? Because I guess there's a movement. I'd like to know. I mean, it, it, it's got to be tonal. It's got to be tonal, you know. Uh, it's got to be something that pleases the ear to them, anyway. You know, I, I'd be interested in finding that out. Yeah. Yes. So, do you know how high, like, how high the harmonica Harmonicas. Um, oh, harmonics. Oh, look, I, I can tell you that, uh, that there might be 20 a month. Let's say there are 20 a month here. No, we're not going to be able to hear all of those because they get higher and higher and higher and they get pretty much out of sight beyond our auditory abilities to hear and also they don't, they're not very musical at, at such a high pitch. So I'm, I'm interested in, in the harmonics that are say, you know, between, uh, between like 100 hertz and, and uh, around 4,000 hertz. You know, that's where most of the music is going on. And if you get up above that, it's like, you know, high, whist high pitch whistles and things like that. Uh, that's, that's not all that much musical, but those, those harmonics still do combine to make tone. They do. You just don't want to hear a lot of them. Like, um, Let's hold off on the questions until we see a little demo. <laughs> <laughs> then we will we will pass the microphone around. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Let's play. Um, what are we gonna do first? You gonna do pipe first or? Uh, oh, he doesn't want to do pipe. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, David David uh, worked out some some mandolin tunes, and so so we're gonna kind of concentrate on lute like stringed instruments for this this uh, engagement. And, uh, so uh, if you've never seen a mandolin before, uh, most of them have eight strings. And, and how are they tuned? They're, they're double sets of... Uh, eight sets of double violin. strings. Uh, it's tuned just like a violin. GD, okay. Did I check my tune? Oh, sure. These songs very well, so I have, to, I have to read a chart. You'll forgive me, though. I hope. Let's see. We're playing The Maid Behind the Bar. How about that for a block? That'll be followed by The Temperance Reel. And finally, one called Fisher's Hornpipe.
Anybody have a question? Oh, good question. I forgot to say anything about that. I, I think I might have mentioned these two are made of steel. So the ones that just look like little silver wires, those are steel. But then the bigger, thicker ones, uh, they look kind of brass colored, and that's because they are. They're made of brass windings around a steel core. Brass is a, a metal alloy. So it's, it winds, winds around a steel core basically to make the strings sound lower in pitch. Question back. Yep. When, when you were doing your amazing demonstrations with the heavy spring, um, it was really great. But on to my soul, why aren't we hearing anything? Oh, well, the frequency is like, you know, it's just a few beats per second, and the lowest we can hear is maybe 40 or 50 beats per second. The lowest possible frequencies that sound like, like a hum or something like that are, are, you know, on the order of 100 beats per second. Yeah. Maybe we all can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> There's another so. reason as well. Uh, if you simply had, well, that uh, spring that was going back and forth, uh, it wasn't attached to anything that could really resonate. If you took a guitar string and simply suspended it from the ceiling, uh, attached it to some fastener uh, somewhere else, and just plucked that string, you wouldn't be able to hear much. Uh, if you really want to hear the guitar string, you have to attach it to a bunch of wood, <laughs> like uh, the body of a guitar. So for example, if I take this uh, tuning fork and I strike it, you can hardly hear it, right? But if I do this, maybe it works better over here. Hear how it amplifies? Yeah. You want to take your vibrating system and attach it to a plate of wood that can vibrate. There's a physics term for this that involves something called impedance matching. <laughs> Actually, I have kind of two questions now that you have the forklift or the fork. Tuning <laughs> fork. <laughs> but first of all, how come you only hear one tone on that? Is the first question. The second one is, what happens when your open tube is a cone? Okay. Uh, oh, like in a trumpet? Yeah, a trumpet, saxophone. Trumpet, versus a clarinet. Saxophone, oboe. Uh, yeah, there's a whole family of uh, wind instruments uh, that are not cylindrical in terms of their bore, but they're more conical inside. And uh, there's a rather strange, I know I'm answering your second question first, but uh, there's a, uh, an interesting physics result for, that's special for conical tubes. And that is, uh, if you have a conical tube that let's say is open at one end, and the other end is a reed, like a clarinet would have, or an oboe would have, Ordinarily, that would behave like a tube that's open at one end and closed at the other. There are reasons for that. But, and that would be the case if the tube were a cylinder. But if the tube is a cone, the mathematics of it works out that the instrument sounds like it's a, an instrument that's open at both ends. It just comes from the geometry of a cone. And that there's, there's no possible way I can elaborate on that here. But if you're interested, I can send you the literature. <laughs> uh, as for the, uh, the tuning fork, uh, you when, when you hit, strike a tuning fork, you are getting a certain fundamental frequency. But there are other harmonics on the tuning fork. In particular, tuning forks have what are called clang modes, which are higher in frequency. They're not whole number multiples of the fundamental. Uh, but you do get harmonics on the tuning fork. Oh, I'm sorry. We have time for a couple more no, questions, and then I'm, uh, we're going to thank these guys. And uh, anyone who can stick yeah, around and help us stack the chairs. We got to do, oh, do the drawing, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, another question first? Another question? 
Oh, just the, the quick question being, with respect to the cones and a lot of physics, at what point in time were the physics understood? Right, so I would imagine physics were studied long after instruments were invented and people understood what made them sound the way they did. Is this on? Yeah. Um, absolutely, you're right. The, the instruments uh, get developed over generations by craftsmen uh, who get really creative. They stumble upon something that works. And uh, it's kind of like nature stumbling upon tricks that work that give us the beautiful fall scenery that we saw driving in here today. If you had trees and whatnot designed by scientists, uh, it, I don't think it would have come out looking as beautiful as, as nature. <laughs> nature so uh, uh, by trial and error, craftsmen over generations have produced wonderful instruments. What we try to do in physics is really kind of understand uh, what those instruments are doing. Now, as far as you know, when was the physics of conical instruments worked out? Um, if I had to make a guess, I would say maybe in mid 20th century. <clears throat> but th those instruments existed long before then. One more question here. So, on your mandolin, you have a capo. Is that I have a capo? capo. Yeah. Um, does that change the harmonic and the key, or just? Well, uh, on, the, on the individual strings, whether you have the capo on or not, you're going to get first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, etc. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, I'll get to that. Have you... I wanted to do this one thing. Uh, Art showed you those various wonderful patterns on this long yellow string. Right? You saw the first harmonic, you saw the second harmonic, you saw the third harmonic. Uh, now. What happens if you just pluck it kind of at random and you get this really weird thing going on? It doesn't look like any one of those individual harmonics, right? What you're getting is all of them. Because you still have the string tied down at that end. You still have the string tied down at the other end. All you can get are harmonics. But instead of isolating individual harmonics like what Art was trying to do for you and what she did, accomplished so beautifully. When you get something that's just kind of a weird mishmash like that, what you're seeing is all the harmonics happening at the same time. And if we had a spectrogram, you know, if, if Art could uh, play his guitar string into what he was trying to bring up before, that spectrogram, you would see the spikes in the spectrum, which represent first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic. They're all going on at the same time when he plays the string, right? Yep, yeah, yeah. Okay. Some harmonics at one time. Now, all I'm doing with the capo is uh, basically shortening all the strings. So instead of the strings vibrating from here to there, they only vibrate from here to there. So I make it essentially a shorter instrument. So it can sound really, really high. <laughs> if I take the capo off, it sounds lower. I thought by playing at a higher pitch, it would cut through some of the ambient noise in the room and be easier to hear. Well, I will add to the ambient noise a little bit. Um, we promised to save time for the drawing from the uh, Arts Board, but first let's thank... Uh, <laughs>